Welcome Bethlehem Church Online family. So glad you're joining us today. My name is Casey. If I've not got the chance to meet you, put a comment in the comments below. I'd love to connect with you if this is your first time. I'd love to hear how you heard about Bethlehem, how you got connected, because even though you're online, you are a part of Bethlehem Church. And I was talking with some people before we got started, and it's crazy how summer is over. Some schools started last week, some start this week. And so I really want to hear from you. Were you like counting down the days till school starts, ready to send your kids back? Or you're like holding on to every last day of summer. I love summer. I never looked forward to going back to school, um, but now as an adult, I don't really have a summer. And so it just is all the same now, but I love the warm weather. And so let me know in the comments below. Um, we've got a very exciting service happening today. And so Pastor Jason is here. We are starting a new series called Contending or Trending and how perfect it is as we start a new school year to think of the question, how do we contend for our faith? And so we had a great start on Thursday night. And so I'm excited for you to hear that today. Um, but I really want to hear from you in the comments of where you're watching from, how you got connected to Bethlehem, and because I will, I'll be in the comments as soon as we get done here. And so that is one of my favorite parts of what I get to do is connect with you each and every week. And it's not just on Sundays. I get to connect with you throughout the week on social media as well. And so as we talk about this contending for the faith or trending with culture, another, a big part of that is social media. And so what I get to do is kind of be a, a light as you scroll through your social media pages. And so with the things that we post, I always want it to be an encouragement to you and so whether it's a fun video whether it's something encouraging in scripture like that is where we can post those things and so we want to encourage you to follow us along on social media because I want to connect with you without throughout the week not just on Sundays and so let me know in the comments um, again where you're watching from and how I can connect with you I'd love to pray with you I'd love to be a part of your life um, but we're going to jump into service and so I'm going to ask you to do something we're going to worship before we go to the message so stand up worship with us and I will see you after the service
I know that there's people coming in here going, if you knew the day I have, you know what I mean? Like some, uh, even when people are saying hey to each other, you're like, don't ask. Don't even ask how I'm doing. Sometimes church turns into fake fest, you know? How you doing? Oh, I'm great, I'm blessed, I'm this and that. And it's like, come on, bull. It's one of those days, one of those weeks, and there's something about God's people coming together shoulder to shoulder and saying, no matter what, me and you, we're gonna worship him. He's worthy of my praise. I'm gonna set aside how I feel, how my day went, what's going on with my kids, my family, whatever, my friends and job. It's time to set it to the side and go, Lord, here's the deal. No matter what the enemy throws at me, I'm gonna give you everything I have because you gave me everything. You laid your life down for me, so I will worship you with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, and all of my strength. So sing with me, rain came. Rain came when blue, my house was built on you. Come on. 
gonna come I hear the chains hit the crown But God of revival that talks about these angels had these bowls full of our prayers. And see what I know from being in church for however long I've been in church now, that sometimes the prayers can seem redundant and we don't see anything happening, so we just stop praying. But the scripture this morning reminded me that our prayers are going somewhere. They do not just hit the ceiling and fall back down. So we are gonna pray for those lost people because you might be the only person in that person's life praying for them. That was me at one time. Somebody was praying for me. And that person turned into another person and they shared with another person. And then the next thing you know, here I am, born again. It can happen. Remember where you were when you came to know Jesus. So Father, in the powerful name of Jesus, and with all the faith in this room that remembers we were dead in our sins until we had an encounter with Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, we were never the same again. God, we ask that you would bring salvation to the people in this room. Name them, say their name. Say it out loud, come on, we're in church, say it out loud. Say their name out loud. Ask God to set them free, because he can do it. God, will you come wherever they are, whatever they're doing, we pray for an enlightenment. We pray for new life in Jesus' name. God, you are not shrinking back. You are bursting forth into light, straight into the darkness. So God, we love you, we give you praise, and we sing this over our lost friends, over our dead friends, the ones that we wanna see come back to life. In the name of Jesus, he can do it, church. Come on, you sing. You sing. Come away. Come away, can you sing? Come away, can you sing? We know that you are waiting to bring another dead soul back to life. So 
we stand in the gap tonight and we say thank you that there is power in the name of Jesus and that there is power in this worship. God, we love you. All of this is for you. It's for the glory of the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. You guys can be seated. Well, good evening, Bethlehem Church. My name is Daniel. I get to be the high school pastor here at Bethlehem. And we are so, we are so excited that you are here to worship with us tonight. We know there's many places you could have been, but it is an honor to have you in this house tonight with us. If this is your first time at Bethlehem, we wanna extend a special welcome to you and just say thank you for being here. We would love to get to know you more. We would love to get to know you more and we would love for you to get to know us more. And the best way to do so is gonna be with our Connect card. You can scan this QR code. It will take you to our Connect card. Uh, it's gonna get some information about you. More importantly, it's gonna give you some information about us. It's gonna let you know everything that is happening here at Bethlehem Church, which one of those things is coming up in just a few days. On August 4th, uh, this Sunday, we are gonna have a night of worship, but we're not gonna have it here. We're not gonna have it in South or at one of our other campuses. We are going to take it to Jug Tavern in the middle of downtown Winder, and we are gonna have a great night there. So go ahead and bring your blankets, bring your chairs, and come uh, worship with us this Sunday night, 5 to 7 p.m. at Jug Tavern. Well, it's awesome to be in this room. It's awesome to be able to hear each and every voice in this room lift up the name of Christ as we get to worship, as we get to worship him, our creator. And another way we worship him is in an act and an obedience of our giving. And at Bethlehem Church, there are four ways to give. They'll be right here. And we thank y'all for that. Well, it's gonna be a great night. I'm excited to see what God is, uh, is doing. I'm excited to see what he's continually gonna do throughout the night but we're gonna jump into a brand new series tonight. So go ahead, grab your Bible, grab your notebooks, and we'll jump right in. Love you guys. Church as school starts back across all of our campuses, OC 211, uh, here at 316 is our friend on island and uh, St. Croix, we love you guys if you're watching online. Uh, a three-week series that we are going to kick off a new school year and to get us where we're going, let me, uh, let me ask you a question um, and, and I guess the way it would go is have you ever been guilty of hearing or have you ever been guilty of hearing somebody talking but not really listening? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like you can own it right there, like what you're doing right now, to me right now, you know what I mean? Like I know there are words coming out of your mouth, right? And there are sounds I'm hearing. But I'm not really listening, I'm not. Maybe you're looking at your phone, maybe you've got your mind somewhere else, right? We've all been guilty of it, and most of the time it doesn't cost you. Like you hear the words that somebody's saying, and you know you should be tuned in, but you're not tuned in. Most of the time it doesn't cost you, uh, but there was one time it almost cost me. Nan and I had been married about a little less than a year at a time, and I was serving as a student pastor at the first church I served in, and we were going with a small group of other men to work with a missionary in Honduras. And this missionary was sponsored by the church that I was serving at. His family lived in Honduras. He served in a big city. But he had made a connection and he had been working with uh, a group that was about two hours away on top of a mountain. 
Uh, and there was kind of a, a third world, like if you can think about really unreached people, top of a mountain, very remote, generationally, they had lived there, and he had developed a relationship with them. And normally you wouldn't take a mission team to a place like this, but there was a small group of us, and we were pastors. And so he had told us, I want to take you guys up there. They've been there for hundreds of years, this, this small tribe, this families that, these families that have been there generationally, and we're going to share the gospel. Here's what he said, but you got to be in shape to make the hike. You got to be in shape. to. Make, he kept saying that. We would meet with him, and he would say, you got to be in shape to make the hike, right? And then we would talk to him on the phone. This is before Zoom. And he would just remind us like, like this isn't like a leisurely hike at Fort Yargo. This, even, this isn't even like an afternoon walking up Stone Mountain. Like this is legit. Right? You got to be in shape, right, to do it. You know, I thought, I heard what he was saying, but I wasn't listening. <laughs> 15 minutes, 15 minutes into this hike up this mountain in this remote part, I knew I was in trouble. And we had half of a day of hiking. There's, there was no like safety boundaries where you could look over and see the scenery. Brother, you were, you were doing it. You know what I'm saying? And we're hiking and we're about three or four hours in and I'm about to die. I, I'm literally complete. Like my wife has always been in shape. I have always been a shape. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so it was like, I should have listened. I should have gotten better shape. And we're a couple hours into this hike. The guys I were with had already gone up ahead of me with a missionary. And there was this Honduran guy who was walking with us, couldn't speak English. And it was just he and I, what I felt like was a half mile, a mile behind. And I'm laying on, I'm laying on the side of a mountain in Honduras. And I'm thinking, this is it, man. I'm about to die. Like, and this was before we had an iPhone and you had pictures on your phone. Do you remember pictures in your wallet? Anybody in the room? I mean, you, you, got, you know what I'm talking about. And so I literally, I thought I was going to, I was sick. I was, I was nauseated. I was dehydrated. And I just start pulling out pictures in my wallet. And I'm like, this is my wife, right? <laughs> tell her I love her. He couldn't speak any English, right? Her, and he's like, mm, mm. You know, tell her I love her. This is my dog. You know what I'm saying? This is my house. Here's my passport when they come to take my body. I thought it was over, man, right? And I, I, I took Spanish in high school, but I wasn't listening again. I was hearing what they were saying, <laughs> right? I thought he was kind of comforting me saying, I love you, amigo. I think he was calling me a crazy gringo. You know what I'm saying? And so <laughs> I was, and so finally, obviously I made it there and made it back. But listen, 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 listen. I was told numerous times it was going to be hard, but I was surprised when it was hard. I was told numerous times I needed to be prepared, numerous times, and I wasn't prepared. I was told numerous times, this isn't for everybody, and you got to be ready to do this, but yet I wasn't. You know what I thought? I hear you. I got this. Sure. Let me ask you a question. Why are we surprised when as Jesus followers, we face opposition when the Bible said we would? Have you ever thought about that? Like the apostle Peter <laughs> calls us exiles and sojourners. All right, what does that mean? This isn't our home. Paul told Timothy, all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. Everybody lean in. He did not say those who live in an Islamic state should expect persecution, but those who live in a country with free speech and freedom of religion don't have to worry about opposition. We just made that up. Right? He didn't say that. Jesus himself in John 15 said to his disciples, listen, if they oppose me, you better believe they're going to oppose you. A servant's not greater than his master. And if they persecuted me, don't be surprised when they stand against you. Peter himself said, don't be surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you as if it were something strange. So in 2012, as the pastor at Bethlehem Church, I began to use a term, and the term was post-Christian. I'd only been the pastor here for about a year at the time, and I got some strange looks when I began to use the term. I had quite a few conversations. The conversations kind of went like this. Pastor, when you say post-Christian, I get it in California and maybe down in the big city and maybe New York, but we're a family community here. Okay. That's who we are, right? We're a family community, 
right? Post-Christian does not mean the nation has no Christians, nor does it mean the country is anti-Christian. It means the society has abandoned Christianity as its stabilizing center. Anybody with any sense of American history at all would tell you our country was founded and the tenets of the founding of our country was founded on Judeo-Christian values. Anybody would. Post-Christian means these values are no longer a driving or shaping influence in our culture. And I want to say this to you with a smile on my face and love in my heart. There's no election cycle going to change that. The ship has sailed, bro. And then I began three years ago to move from post-Christian, and I kind of dropped that term, and I said, now we live in a post-truth society. And a post-truth society is the only logical end to a post-Christian society, right? That is the term I've been using the last three years. Our society now defines truth by feelings rather than facts. Now, candidly, the thing that's scary is not that we argue what's over what's true. The thing that's really scary is we can't even agree on a set of facts, right? We can't even agree on a set of facts. And then last weekend, not so subtly in secret, but overtly in front of hundreds of millions of onlookers at the opening ceremony of the Olympics in Paris, The global athletic event of every tribe, every nation, and every tongue that happens every four years. The global athletic event that happens every four years. The Last Supper of Jesus and his disciples was mocked with all types of sexual perversion. I've had a lot of emails and a lot of questions. Jason, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I thought it was blasphemous. I thought it was mocking the Son of God. I thought it was mocking the Savior of the world. I thought it was offensive. But you know what? I wasn't shocked. See, moral relativism, secularism, and humanism, which are the predominant beliefs of our days in this society, right? God is man and man is God. Most of those philosophies date back a few centuries ago to French philosophers. Before there was Hollywood, there was Paris, France. Right? The question, though, is we need to ask ourselves is why is it Christianity that's mocked publicly? Why is it belittled? Why is it scorned? Why not the Islamic faith? There's about 2 billion Muslims on planet Earth. Why not Buddhism? Why is it mocked? There's almost 1.8 billion, 1.8 billion Buddhists on earth. Why not another religion? Why Christianity? Because there is power in the name of Jesus. Because there is power in the name of Jesus. The gospel is a message of hope to a dying world, but it's foolishness to people who think they can save themselves. It's always been that way. Listen, the gospel is you can't save yourself but Jesus can. The gospel message is not just a threat to the enemy. It's the declaration that our enemy doesn't have the last say. Church, so listen to me. Satan hates every spiritual blessing in Christ. He hates Christ's power. He hates Christ's forgiving grace. He hates Christ's transforming grace. Satan hates the gospel and he hates the church. Satan hates happy marriages and he hates Christ-centered families. He hates personal holiness and he hates personal obedience. The devil hates Christians who stand their ground. For a few weeks, this is what we're going to talk about church as the dark gets darker the light gets to shine brighter and you better believe the dark is getting darker as the dark gets darker the light gets to shine brighter every person in this room listen to me the culture we live in that you're raising a family in that you're sucking oxygen in that you're going to school in way more resembles Babylon and ancient Rome than it does Mayberry And sometimes we just have a wake-up call, man, right? Like, I love the all-shucks nature of Andy Griffin and Barney Fife. I mean, it warms my heart. One of the greatest shows of all time. Those boys have been dead for a while, right? Those guys have been dead for a while. That's not where you and I live. It's not where we live. 
I love what G.K. Chesterton said. He said, a Christianity, right, a Christianity that is without friction in the culture is a Christianity that dies. What do you say? Jesus follower, your life is meant to stand out. Every one of you is what you were called and created for if you're a Jesus follower. As your pastor, I look to the future and I'm wide-eyed and I look to the future and I'm not fearful, I am full of hope. I am a father of three and I'm not fearful, right? I have hope for them. As a pastor, I know where we are ministering and what we're called to and I'm convinced the gospel message is more needed than ever before. The line I told our students at student camps this summer, I'm gonna continue to say, you've got to embrace, you were made for this day and this day was made for you. As Jesus followers, we have to wake up and go, I was made to live in this time, and this time was made for me. So for the next three weeks, I'm going to look at this one little book in the New Testament called Jude. And it's a a little studied book, and it's a little known about book, because candidly, it's a little book. Right? It's one chapter. And I don't think the location of it is by surprise. It comes right before Revelation. And the message couldn't be louder and clearer. So for three weeks, as we walk into a new school year, right, here, here's the questions I want to answer. What does it mean to contend for the faith? Next week, what are we contending against? And last, how, what does it look like to be faithful to the end? So you get your Bibles. We're going to hop in. Jude chapter 1. Let me read it to you. Here's what it says. Jude a servant of Jesus Christ. Underline that word if you get your Bibles. Highlight it if it's on your phone. Remember it if you're looking at it. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, this is so big, I wanted to talk to you all about our common salvation. I found it necessary to write to you, or to write appealing to you, here's the words, to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. This is so big. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So who in the world is Jude? Well, Jude was the brother of James. Who's James? James is the brother of Jesus. And so let's do the math. If Jude's the brother of James and James the brother of Jesus, who's our Ju- uh, of Jesus, who's Jude the brother of? Man, you guys are smart. But he doesn't refer to that. He doesn't refer to himself as a brother of Jesus. He refers to himself as a servant of Jesus. Why? Jude, like the rest of Jesus' family, didn't believe he was the Messiah. And early in their life, they were trying to quiet him down, saying, Jesus, you're on the crazy train. You're our brother. You're not the son of God. You're not the Messiah. What changed Jude's mind? The greatest apologetic in the world is I saw my brother killed on a Roman cross. And then a few days later, we are, I saw my brother, uh, brother killed on a Roman cross. We buried him in the tomb. And then three days later, I saw him again. And when I saw my brother again, I knew he wasn't my brother. I knew he's the savior of the world. I'm his servant. So he identifies himself as a servant. He says, those who are called... Right? Those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. The New Testament understanding of what it means to be a Christ follower is to be called, to be set apart for purpose and on a purpose, to be called out. Now, our understanding, and again, you may be new to the faith, maybe coming back to the faith, but our understanding many times in the States, especially in the South, is Jason, you're called, a missionary's called, a pastor's called, I'm a Christian. You're called, I'm a Christian, right? Listen, here's what I'm saying. If you're a Jesus follower, 100%, you have been called and set apart. What do you mean? You did not wake up one day and think, you know what, today I think I'm gonna follow Jesus. That's not the way it works, right? He stirred in you. He woke you. He softened your heart, 
right? You're not a Christ follower because you were raised in the South and your mommy and daddy go to church and you went to church with them. And so you inherited the fact. It's not the way it works. If you're a Jesus follower, it's because he did something new. He stirred in you. He called you. It's not a family heirloom. Faith is not a family heirloom we pass down. John 6, or excuse me, Jesus says, listen, you can't come to the Father. Anybody who follows me, you can't come to follow me unless the Father stirs in you. If you listen to last week's message, I talked about, do you remember if you were here, the guy on the Harley Davidson? Raise your hand. You remember Harley Davidson? Okay, if you weren't, go back and listen. Talked about a guy, uh, another pastor who's a friend, mentor. He talked about it, changed his church. He judged this guy who didn't look the part. He was rode Harley Davidson as he came into his church late, and this guy set off a revival in his church, and it changed the pastor's life. I told that story. After the 930 service, here, I'm standing in the lobby, and a guy walks up with big tears in his eyes and shakes my hand and said, I'm the biker you were talking about. Now, okay, hold on. The, he was saying, I'm the biker. I'm like that guy. You're like, really, that guy? <laughs> I got to correct that, right? Y'all are like, no way, right? You got chill bumps. He says, it's still awesome. He said, I'm the biker of Bethlehem Church. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, four weeks ago, I'm driving down Highway 11 on a Wednesday. Traffic's awful because they're doing construction on 316. My life's a complete mess. I'm not sure what's going on. And for whatever reason, on my Harley, I pulled in here, and one of your youth pastors was working on the basketball goal, getting ready for youth ministry that night. And he began to talk to me. He began to pray for me. And I've been coming ever since. I don't know. Well, listen to me. Hold on. I don't know why I'm coming, and I don't know what's going on. But with big tears in his eyes, he hugged me and said, could you pray for me? Look at me right here. Can I tell you? Can I tell you what's going on? He's being called. That's the gospel. He's being called out, right? And then he says this, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you. Here it is. Say these words with me. To what? Contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. If you're taking notes, here's what it means to contend. That word is an athletic word. It's an athletic term. You don't find it much in the New Testament. It's a strong, forceful word. To contend for something is to strive, to strain, to struggle, to put forth great effort. To put forth great effort. Any athletic competition, football, baseball, soccer, basketball, to be a contender means you're in the competition. To be in contention means you're in the fight. You're competing. Now lean in. And the result, right, the fruit you experience is directly tied to the effort you put in. Contend for the faith. Contend means you don't just assume a faith, right? Contend means you just don't inherit a faith. Contend means you just don't invent a faith that works for you. Contending for the faith doesn't mean to simply resist attacks from the enemy, but to earnestly and vigorously fight for the truth, right? Contending for the faith is the call for the church to be on the offense and not just play defense. And we've got to re-envision what that means. The gospel of Jesus, I need you to listen to me, suburban parents, moms, and dads. The gospel of Jesus is more than our defense from darkness. It's the call to overcome evil with good. Parents, contending for the faith doesn't mean our call is just to protect our kids from a big, bad world, but to actually equip equip them with the gospel that shines a light so bright that the darkness cannot contend. Contending for the faith, church, means us, the church, this place, at your campuses, one hour a week. It's not your safe place to you where you run and hide, but it's actually the army that Jesus is rising up. That's what it means to contend. And here's what Jude knew. This is what I want you to hear. If you don't contend, strive, strain, struggle for the faith, you will be conformed by the culture you are in. This is what he says is so big. This is so big. For certain people have crept in, pause. The culture infiltrates the church. 
who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert. So what he's saying, pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny our own uh, master and Lord of Jesus Christ. What he's saying, listen to me. What he's saying is what happens if you aren't actively contending for the faith, right? Even in the church, things get upside down. The darkness of the world will corrode, pervert, and conform your life. And here's what he's saying. This is the caution. You won't reject the faith, but you will settle into a cheap knockoff version of the faith. A watered down version of the faith. Jude's warning, and what we're going to talk about for a few weeks very practically, is to contend for the faith. If you don't contend, you will be conformed by the culture. And here's what I want you to see. There's no middle ground. That's what our culture has lost. There's not a middle ground any longer. A casual, soft center. What God is saying to the church is if you are not actively contending for your faith, you by default are being conformed by the culture. And at best, your faith is complacent. It's not what any of us want, not what any of you want. You wouldn't be at a church on a weekend, right? You, what, what he's saying is ultimately your faith begins to serve you. Your faith serves your middle class suburban lifestyle. What Jude is saying is if you aren't contending for the one faith that was handed down, delivered once, you will have a pretend faith. Jesus ends up serving you and you aren't serving Jesus. You know how it works? Your faith becomes a life insurance policy. When somebody gets cancer, you run to Jesus, but the rest of the time you just live your life. If you don't contend for the faith, you're being conformed by the culture. So let me give you three thoughts, real simply. We're going to talk about this for a few weeks. When you say contend for the faith, three quick thoughts, all right, that I could encourage you, whatever you're in, all of us are called out, you at your job, you and your family, you and your home. What do you mean contend for the faith? That's a big idea. Not just Jason the pastor or a missionary in a foreign country, but you as a believer in Jesus Christ in post-Christian, post-truth America. Here's what I would say. You gotta embrace that I have a personal faith and a public witness. We use the words personal and private interchangeably in our society. This is so big. Did you listen to this? Something that is personal means it personally affects me. But private is the idea that it's something that's meant to be kept out of the knowledge of others. So what happens is our culture's position on a person's faith is this. Believe what you want, but keep it to yourself. So in return, what happens is you and I feel or we are being conformed to think, well, Jesus can work for you and your family. And so what we think is really, I'm only responsible for me and my family. So here's what we think. Well, me and my family are for Jesus. Who am I to say what other people should believe? But the first descriptive phrase Jesus ever used when he talked about his followers was, you're the, salt of the or, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. You're a city on a hill. What does that mean? You were meant to stand out. Right? So what, I'm, what are you saying? Jesus works for me is not contending for the faith. Jesus works for me and my family. Who am I to say? That's not contending for the faith. That's being conformed by the culture. Right? And what happens, and I pastored for two decades. I got a buddy who's been a pastor a lot longer than me sitting in the back. I just saw him. I can own this, and I think we all have to own this. I think at, a, at times, our desire to reach people and love, we are tempted to lower the bar of personal faith and a pub, being a public witness. What do you mean, lower the bar? <laughs> Well, I'm telling you right now across all of our campus, I'm going to get an email on this. I'm used to it, but I'm saying this. Many of you, when you hear me contend for the faith, here's the filter you hear it through. I need to vote a certain way. I need to have family values, and I need to be a good patriot. That's what you've heard me say. That's how crazy we've lost what the true faith is. I hope you do all of those things, right? What are you saying, Pastor? And everybody listen to me. There is not an American faith and an African faith. There's not an Australian faith and a Canadian faith. There's not a first century faith and a 21st century faith. There is one faith delivered to all for the saints. And the Constitution is not that faith. The cross of Jesus Christ is. 
That's the center, right? And it's what changes our life and calls us to mission. Don't interpret your faith through a lens that the Bible never talks about. That's when we've been conformed by our culture. Well, this is what my faith is. Jesus works for me and my family is not contending for the faith. You wouldn't be here if you believed that because you're like, no, no, there's more. God's calling us to something. Here's the second thing, really easy. Be loud about the truth and be quiet about my opinions. Man, oh, man. Man, oh, man. Contend for the faith. That means you better yell at them down, man. That's what I love what pastors say. Contend for the faith. Let's go pick a fight. That's what I'm saying. So relax. Let's make sure we're on the same page. Opinions, this is, going, this is groundbreaking here. Opinions are subjective and open to interpretation. Truth is objective and based on evidence. Tracking with me? Opinions are subjective and based on your perspective. Truth is facts based on evidence. Here's what's happened, though, and it, it permeates its way into the church. The noise of our society means we're conditioned to be loud about anything and everything. The more outraged and offended we can be, the more the news cycle is driven, the more social media gets clicks, the more TikTok videos gets watched, the more likes it's produced. And well, here's what I'm saying. We, what if, we lose the actual truth in a sea of opinions. Well, this is my take. This is my perspective. Here's my conspiracy theory. The church is kings of conspiracy theories. Room's quiet. This is my thoughts. This is my angle. So what I think, it's my position. Listen, 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 listen. Contending for the faith isn't being loud like the world about every opinion. Contending for the faith doesn't mean we're called to look for a fight. When can you look at the life of Jesus and the gospels never see that? See, sometimes we won't ever say it. But in a time like this, where our society so has changed and there's so much coming at us in so many different ways and we just want to put our head down, sometimes we won't come out and say it, but I think that deep down, you know what we want? We want there to be a better strategy than love your neighbors yourself. We want there to be a better game plan than turn the other cheek. Yeah, 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 turn the other cheek, but how are we going to win? Yeah, 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 love your neighbors yourself, but how are we going to win? How are we going to show, right? That's, I mean, man, we long for it. I love what Paul tells young Timothy. What does he say at the end? I have fought the good fight. You know what he didn't say? I have fought every fight. What's the good fight? The fight of truth. You know where ground zero for truth in my life is? Ground zero. I want to be loud about the truth and quiet about my, and listen, I could, Stand up here, and I got a whole lot of opinions. That's my wife. I had a lot of opinions. Did you guys never hear? Because I want to be loud about the truth, because that's what it means to contend for the faith. I want to be loud about the gospel. And ground zero for truth in my life, and ground zero for truth in your life, is the change that Jesus has made. So what do you mean? Like, I wasn't a kid who was bad and became good because I found Jesus. I was a self-righteous, lost, hypocritical, southern fried, religious, lost in his sin, going to hell, little teenager in a Baptist church, and Jesus woke me up and saved me. I was dead in my sin. I wasn't party on the weekend. I was just a religious Pharisee, and I was dead in my sin, and Jesus made me alive. That's ground zero. You guys know I'm not a poet. <laughs> Like you're like, I love, no, I'm not a poet at all. But a pastor friend of mine named Carter, he penned something and it so jumped on me. And he penned it as he sees the outrage in our society. And he sees the temptation when he thinks contend for the faith. Be outraged! But the reality is ground zero for the truth is when I look in the mirror, the ground zero for the truth is that I've been changed. So I want you to hear his words. I'm borrowing from him. It so gripped me. This is, this is what he said. I'm outraged at the persistence of my own sin and the transgressions I seem to commit again and again. I'm outraged by the log in my own eye and my refusal to pick up my cross and die. 
I'm outraged at my lack of concern for the poor and my continued pursuit of more. I'm outraged at how little in life I've done for orphans and widows while looking out for number one. I'm outraged at how easily I failed to love my neighbor and so readily pierce them with my judgmental saber. I'm outraged at how selfish I can be in my propensity to do what's best for me. I'm outraged sometimes when I look in the mirror because the hypocrite staring back at me, can I get a witness, couldn't be any clearer. I'm outraged at my failures as a father and a husband and a man have I actually done the absolute best that I can. I'm outraged at my pitiful and paltry life of prayer, how I've made decisions barely acknowledging God is even there. I'm outraged at the faith I've been so hesitant to share, have the lost around me wondered if I even care. I'm outraged at my struggle to be sanctified, to be holy and pure, and the sin sickness in my bones that won't surrender to Christ's cure. I'm outraged that I'm still so broken, though Jesus says I'm whole, I'm still an infant in faith with a body that's so old. Anybody? I'm outraged I'm not as far as long as I should be, and that for much of my life it hasn't even bothered me. I'm outraged that I can't ever seem to get it exactly right, and that sometimes it feels like Satan is winning this inward fight. I'm outraged at me. I don't have any outrage left for all that others are telling me I should be. I'm outraged. And thank God he's not. His mercy has outgraced my outrage at my own inability to get it all right. Because of Jesus, I'm loved, I'm forgiven. Because of Jesus, I'm free, and I'm welcomed. Because of Jesus, I'm healed. Because of Jesus, I'm new. And there is really only one word for that kind of love, outrageous. And this is the best part. We could spend our lives being outraged by whatever bad news is next in line or by sharing the outrageous good news that's changed your life and mine. How good is that? Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Across all of our campuses. To contend for the faith doesn't mean to scream at the dark. It means to be so committed to the light. To contend for the faith means the ground zero of a change in a person's life is Jesus. And the church is for what's good and what's pure and what's holy and what's loving. To contend for the faith means it's about what we're for and not just against. And church, let me end by saying this. Accept the cost and know you're kept by Christ. Ground zero, right, is to accept the cost and know you're kept by Christ. Being set apart means you're set apart. Your job, you're like, no, man, I'm called to do this. Or, no, no, you're gifted to do what you're doing. Make sure you get this. You're talented. You have a passion. But if you're a believer, you're called out set apart by Christ. You're gifted. You're talented. So you use those things in the arena that you're in. And the temptation of the last hundred years in the the modern church in America has been to claim a faith that doesn't cost us and only benefits us. And the invitation to contend for the faith is, I accept the cost and I know I'm kept by Christ. Here's what Jude said, to those who are beloved and kept by Christ. Church, it is to embrace that you are not holding up. You You have never been holding him up. He's the one holding you up. That the reality for us in this season, in this time as believers, is there's never been a better time. There's never been a better opportunity. There's never been more of a chance to contend for the faith. In the turmoil, in the chaos, in the idolatry, in all the pursuits that we do, that we would go, whoa, 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 I'm set apart. 
and what I'm good at and what I'm gifted at, what I'm talented at, where I'm placed at. I'm called more than just to make money. I'm called to more just to, but I, there's something God has called me to and he set me apart in my family that we embrace that. So here's what I want to do. Across all of our campus, I want to close by simply saying this. I'm going to say a statement of blessing. I want to pray a prayer of blessing over you, every campus. And what I want to do, I want to do it two ways across all of our campuses. If you are a student or a teacher, you work or connected to school, coach, administration, students, uh, bus drivers, you work in the school system, you are in that season of your life across all of our campuses. And I want you to stand with me. Just stand with me, just those. Back in school, all over, all over the place. So I want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. If you're a teacher, if you're an administrator, if you're a coach, this is me saying to you, thank you for serving the next generation. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for giving yourself to the next generation. Students, you are called. You have one season. Your life will never be more surrounded than it is right now with people. Don't waste it. You got an opportunity. You'll fail. You'll mess up. And he'll pick you up. All right, so I want to say this over you. This is a prayer blessing. I just want you to, with your head bowed and eyes closed, just to receive this. You're a contender for the faith, not a pretender of the faith. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Will you receive that? You're a contender, not a pretender. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Where you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in you being there. Christ lives in you and has something he wants to do through you right where you are. Believe this and go in the grace and love and power of Jesus Christ. Campus pastors, you can take it, take it. I want you to pray that over your campus. Everybody else, I want you to stand with me. And I want to pray the same prayer over you. And I just want you to receive this. It's a prayer of blessing. Wherever your job is, whatever your family is, whatever's going on, as our prayer teams make their way down front. There is power in the name of Jesus. You're a contender, not a pretender. There is power in the name of Jesus. You go nowhere by accident. Well, there is power in the name of Jesus. Wherever you are, God is sending you and has and placed you. every chain, yeah. Wherever you are, God has put you there. There is power Just in this, church. the name of Jesus. The family you're in is not by accident. There is power The in job you the have for 30 years Jesus. is not by accident. The and neighborhood you're in, God has a purpose in, in you being the name there. Of Jesus. Christ lives in you and has to something every chain. he wants break to do every through chain. you right where Whoa. you live. There is power that you would believe this in the and that you would Jesus. go in the grace and the love and the power in the of name Jesus Christ. Jesus. Can we declare this as we close? There is power, there's power in the name of Jesus. She have us lead us. In the name of Jesus, yes, to break every chain, break every chain, break every Come on, sing this again. If you've been set free, and there is power.
Father, it is in the name of Jesus we pray that there's the power in the name of Jesus that you've called us and that we were made for this day and this day was made for us. Maybe in this room, there's been a stirring in you. And the reality is, as we close in just a few moments, you keep coming back again and again and again, and God's doing something. You're not exactly sure what. That's why our prayer teams are here. And maybe there's somebody you're praying for, one of those names that we said. That's why our prayer teams are here. Father, there's an army rising up. Sheva, sing that over us. That is the church as we close. Father, it's in the name of Jesus, thankful for this church and this community at this time, you've called us to contend for the faith. That we live, that we strive, that we effort, and that we wanna be people who are faithful in this arena, in the sphere you've called us to. That we're not outraged, but we're overwhelmed by the outrageous news that has changed our life. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Everybody at Bethlehem Church said, so our, our prayer teams are here. Before you leave, let me say something to you. Uh, I told you Thursdays are my favorite service of the weekend, and uh, they are. And so as the summer concludes, I added a few people with the football team being here. We love you guys. Uh, but if you're a Thursday night, what I did is my favorite ice cream in the whole town is called Cast Iron in Winder. So I've got homemade ice cream out here for you guys. A scoop, and this is my way of saying thank you for making Thursday your home. Sunday don't get it. They just get lectured from me about there's too many of them, right? And so if you want some ice cream, do it. Our prayer teams are here. I'd love to meet you at and be blessed. We will see you next week. Hey, y'all, thanks so much for sticking around. I told you I would be back, but man, what a great service. And there's so many things thrown at us, whether it's from social media to the news, whatever it looks like. I know you see it each and every day and just the feel of like the pressure of culture. And so I love this message. I had to pull my phone out so I didn't say it wrong. But as the dark gets darker, the light gets to shine brighter. Wow, what a opportunity we have to shine the light of Christ in all that we say and all that we do. Instead of fighting against the culture, we get to stand and to love people the way that Christ has called us to. And so I want to make sure I have that in front of me all week long. So I want to encourage you to do the same. Whether it was that point or something else that stood out to you, write it down. Put it on your mirror. Put it on a sticky note so you can be encouraged by that throughout the week. And so we can contend with our faith together because we're not called to do this alone. And so I'd love to come alongside of you, whether it's praying for you, whether it's um, helping answer any questions that you have. So I'd love to connect you with someone. So put any questions below, um, put up any prayer requests below. You can always head over to our prayer wall. Um, but that is one of my favorite things I get to do is pray for you to walk this journey with you. Um, but I'm so thankful for you. So glad you joined us today. I will see you next Sunday. And so I love you and hope you have a great rest of your day.